recording and you did the so we're good uh wait no i still can't mess with the chat because i'm just co-host i'm not host. um okay i'll make you co-host let me let everyone in and hold on okay wait, sure are you sure you can't do it it's not letting me Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna make you co-host, but just unmute me. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna make you host. Okay, hold on. But then make me co-host. Okay. Can you do it to the version of me that's muted? Hold um, hold on. Here's the muted version. Make huh? host. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you're you're a host now. Okay. Are you good now? Okay, now yeah, can I'm you do the setting? And then I'm gonna mess with it. I'm gonna fix the chat settings right now. Okay, go ahead. Are you good? Yeah. Good? Yep, I'm good. Okay, hold on. I'm letting everyone in. 50 participants in our meeting. Hold on. Yay. Okay, everyone's in. Good. And you made me co-host, right, Mo? Yes. And your host. Okay. Hello, children. Who's excited to be with Queller Prep again at 8 p.m. on a school night? Yay! Who's excited? Yay! Nobody's excited. Yay, Theo, you're excited. Theo, we love you. Anyone else? Yay! Who's excited? Who's excited to learn essay? Yay! Yay! We're gonna learn about essay writing at 8 p.m. on a school night. What could be better? Everyone, I just wanna let you know that we are so proud of you. You make me my name is Francis Queller. I'm the director, and we're so proud of you for being here at 8 p.m. on a school night. Um, as you know, the Hunter exam is coming up, it's about a week from today. Mo Khan, I want to say thank you. Thank you for 10 plus years of loyalty and dedication to the students at Queller Prep. I want to say thank you to the students who are joining in 8 p.m. Zoom on a school night. I want to say thank you to the parents who allow us to work with your children. And I really want to say thank you to me, myself, and I for organizing this at eight o'clock on a weeknight with three little children at home and quite a lot of responsibilities. Mo, without further ado, can you please tell the students about yourself? Can you also please um, give them all of your heartfelt advice and guidance? I want to um, shift to Mo Khan in a moment. I just want to remind all of you the Hunter essay prompts from prior years. I'll put it in the chat. I just want to remind you last year they used a visual um, essay. It was a graphic essay. And I just want to remind you that that was very, very different from what we had before. Okay. So I'm going to send you um, the different like prompts I'll put in the chat box. Okay, Mo, go ahead. You can take over from here. Okay. And I do right. want to share with everyone, thank you so much to all the students who are here and listening and learning, okay? I'm sending you past prompts, okay? Go ahead. Go ahead, Mo. It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Francis. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so my name is Mo. I'm one of the tutors here at Queller. Uh, I've been tutoring in New York City for now, gosh, it's got to be, what, 16 years? It's longer than all of you have been alive. But um, I, and for the last almost 12 years now, uh, 11 years now, I've been with Queller, about to be 12, and I have been extremely lucky to work with Francis um, and the team at Queller Prep and all of the students and parents that have um, come here. So a little bit about myself. I was once in your shoes a long, long, long time ago, uh, back in 2006 when I sat for the Hunter test, and I remember it very clearly. I went to the um, the actual uh, campus school on 94th Street between Park and Madison. There was this gigantic line outside. My dad had taken me there with a, one of my cousins. And I went inside, took a three-hour exam, and I came back out. And then a few weeks later, um, we found out about um, you know, my acceptance. And then I started six years um, at Hunter from seventh grade to 12th grade. 
after that, I went to um, NYU, um, where I got um, two degrees in one in biochemistry, one in global public health. I went on to get an MBA. I took like YAMCAT, the LSAT, the GMAT. Um, basically, I have never stopped really learning um, through the years. And um, one thing that I've been doing while doing all of these things uh, for myself is I've always been tutoring because I think it's really important to always kind of give back prepare like the next generation of kids, innovators, um, you know, future leaders and so on and so forth. Hunter is a great school. Um, and that's why I've always felt like um, always connected to it, not only just from going there, but even years since past. And so today we're gonna be talking about the test and primarily the essay. And so I will give you all time to kind of like go through questions and, and ask me things, but I have prepared a bunch of PDF uh, pages here and you'll see me very shortly sharing my screen. So if you can see my screen, please just give me a thumbs up using the reactions in Zoom and you'll see right away um, a file on this app that I use called GoodNotes, which is basically my whiteboard. And it should say the Hunter essay, the personal narrative essay. We're gonna talk all about the Hunter essay here. We're gonna talk about what makes a successful Hunter essay. And even as the essay begins to change, what things must remain the same for it to be integrally part of Hunter, right? Um, because of course, um, as um, you know, Francis had pointed out, Ms. Pilar pointed out, the essay last year, the prompt was different and it had thrown some people off. And so I don't want anywhere here, anyone here to be thrown off by it. And instead we're gonna figure out a way to kind of still be able to conquer it, if that makes sense. I also wanna so remind hope- all of you to check the chat box right now. And I just wanna make sure you know, we put all the old prompts that we collected over the years. So this way you have like an idea, but basically it was a personal narrative essay all the time, even though the picture last year really threw a lot of people off because it was different from prior years. Um, so be prepared. It might be a creative work, not just an essay prompt, which is really straightforward, but it was a personal narrative either way. All right. So I'm going to put myself on mute, but I want everyone to know that in the chat, we put the uh, prior essay prompts. Yeah. So uh, we're going to go through the essay. The first thing I'm going to talk about is before the essay actually comes on, right? What are the other parts of the test you have to conquer, right? So about 3000 students of uh, probably a bit more this year, if I'm being honest, because of the way that they've been doing the test since um, COVID has happened. Um, 3,000 plus students sit for the exam. And out of those 3,000, they usually take the first, the top 500 uh, multiple choice scores to have their essays read. So what that means is that if your multiple choice score does not meet the cutoff, then your essay won't be read, right? Or your writing piece, whatever it may be. Does everybody understand that? So you should, of course, the essay is a very important component of the test because after the multiple choice, when they read the top 500 essays, that is the only deciding factor that decides whether or not you get admission. So of course, the essay is the thing at the end that decides whether you get into Hunter or not. But to even get to that step, you need to make sure that the rest of your test you are, is strong, right? That you take care of your reading comprehension, you take care of the multiple choice math questions. And so those things are not things that you can forget about nor should you rush through those sections in order to just get to the essay. Because what would be terrible is if you spend all your time working on this magnificent essay and then they never actually get to read it, right? That would not be what we're going for here. So first, let me talk to you about what are the three most important things that the essay must do. Um, By the way, I'm scribbling on the page. Can everyone see the scribble? Just to make sure it's still working. Just give me another thumbs up. I can see your reactions. Wonderful. Okay, great. So. I know I've numbered them here, like one, two, and three, but in reality, they're like one A, one B, one C. All three of them are extremely important, right? The number one thing is answer the prompt. So if you write an amazing essay, or you hit everything that you're supposed to hit, but it's off topic, you're not gonna gain it, um, admission into Hunter, right? Think about it in the simplest of manners. If they're giving up a seat, right? And taking you into Hunter, a school that a lot of people compared to like private schools where people pay tens of thousands of dollars to send their kids and give you this education in this kind of setting, at the very least, they want someone who can follow directions. So answering the prompt is the most important thing. After that, in your writing, you need to showcase your ability as a writer. So can you write descriptive um, sentences? Are you thoughtful in how you uh, organize your essay? Um, Is it well-organized? Do you use a good amount of of vocabulary, right? Um, Do you use proper sentence structure and is it varied, right? Um, and of course, they stress the show don't tell. We'll talk about that a bit later. But that's using figurative language to be descriptive to make the reader feel like they're there in the story that you're creating within your essay with you. Right? 
the next thing is, remember, Hunter doesn't have an interview portion, right? A lot of other schools have interviews, um, especially if they're small schools like Hunter, which has about 200 seats a grade. And so since there's no interview, how do they get to know about you? Well, oftentimes the essay has a personal component. They ask you a certain type of question that um, makes you have a you know, self-reflection in terms of answering it. So when they ask you a question like, who's your everyday superhero? They look at what qualities you find admirable in other people. Does everyone understand? So those are the ways that they kind of take those questions in in an interview. So you never want to put yourself in any kind of negative light, right? Think about how you're phrasing things when you're talking about yourself, because oftentimes when we're talking or speaking like normally in regular conversation, we might say something hyperbolic, like, oh my gosh, um, you know, I was being a brat or anything like that. Right? Of course, you mean it playfully, like when you're talking amongst your friends or with your parents, but you never want to cast a negative light on yourself when you're writing the essay. So keep that in mind as well. So these are the three things that they look for, no matter what type of writing piece you have, in some shape or form, they're going to come up, right? And so it's like 1A, 1B, 1C, and these are the three most important things. Is everyone clear on that before I move on? Okay, fantastic. I'm seeing some people nodding their heads. If you have your cameras off, it's perfectly fine. But if you have them on, it just helps me engage with you better. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move down. So here are some, you know, tips of writing any kind of good personal narrative. Uh, begin with a catchy hook, right? You want to draw the reader in. Remember, they have to read over 500 essays. If you want to make your stand out, you want to get their attention from the beginning and you want to keep that attention throughout. You want to have a clear answer to your prompt and kind of like a mini outline to your essay in the first paragraph, which should be relatively short. You want to separate events into uh, different paragraphs. You don't want to have all of your ideas jumbled into one. That's going to make it hard to follow. Beware of sentence structure. Write sentences that are clear and concise and try for some sentence variety. So what do I mean by sentence variety? The worst thing you could do is have every single sentence start the same way. I did this. I did that. I slept. I walked. I this. It becomes very monotonous and it becomes very boring to read. It puts someone to sleep. So you definitely want to get rid of that. You want to have a good mixture of short, medium, and long sentences. Of course, not too many should be too long and not too many should be too short. You have to use them effectively. Be, word of, uh, be aware of word choice, right? Think about the words you're using. Are they appropriate in that sentence? Are they the right word you're thinking of or is a better synonym available? Get rid of dead words, right? Words that are just taking up space but don't really add anything. Um, I would say the same thing about sentences. If there's a sentence that doesn't really add to uh, the point of this body paragraph, why are you using it there, right? You have limited space. Make sure every single sentence counts. Use sophisticated words instead, right? But know what they mean. So I know that you all have a wonderful vocabulary because of this um, core prep system and what we put, um, have you all do for homework and the vocab quizzes, but make sure that you're using the words correctly. If you're just using a big vocabulary word, but you're using it incorrectly, that's gonna make your essay sound worse, not better, right? Have a clear conclusion, which should restate the words from the prompt and your essay as a whole. Uh, conclusion is very important. It sets the tone of how your essay ends. I always say when you make an impression on someone, they always remember their first impression of you and the last impression you give before you kind of walk out the door. So this is kind of like that last impression. And bring back the hook to form a circle, right? It's like a nice, um, you know, a bow to tie everything up. That's how the conclusion should be, okay? Any questions on these broad tips overall? I hope you all are taking notes. I'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit just to show you what's a good way to take notes for today, tonight. I would usually, if we were in person, you would get this handout. And on the top, it says things to emphasize and things to avoid. So these are things you should do and things are things that you shouldn't do. That's it's a really nice way to organize because that's really what we're talking about with the essay, right? Things to do, things that are good practice and things to avoid that people usually your age and anyone in writing have a tendency to do. And you want to fix that. All right, going back to where I was, right? We're gonna move on to what show don't tell me. So this is actually from a college writing um, worksheet that I've gotten. So show don't tell, it's like a small little packet. Uh, and we're just gonna go through some of these examples, but not all of them. Um, uh, and I see your questions popping up. So I'm gonna kind of refrain from them. But if you have a question and you have a hard time remembering your question, please write it down right now. I promise I'll get to it, okay? We're gonna take little breaks and that's where I'll go to the chat and I'll look through the questions. All questions are coming towards me anyway, so I'll just look through them, all right? And if you have a question, you'll notice that there's two versions of me, one that's muted and one that isn't. Direct the question towards the one that is muted because that's the one on my computer so I can you know keep track of everything, all right? 
So show, don't tell. What show, don't tell really means is instead of telling the reader what's happening, show them. Use description to help them come into the story. Take, uh, put them in your shoes. So here's an example of a telling sentence. And then they're going to give you an example of a showing one. So of course, we're not going to write about this particular topic, but this is a great example of creating a mini story or detail to make the reader feel like they're there. So the telling sentence was, Jack was afraid. And the showing one is, as the footsteps tapped closer and closer, Jack felt his stomach muscles tighten. He flattened himself to the wall, the gritty bricks against his cheek, so it chilled his palms. He used both hands to steady the gun. Of course, this wouldn't be anything that you write in your essays, but do you understand, do you see the difference between the telling sentence and the showing sentence here? How much more effective it is in the, uh, the second one in making the reader feel like they're there experiencing this um, fear that Jack has. Does everyone understand? So an exercise, right? Because you have the test coming up soon. And if you have any area of weakness, this is the way you should practice. Um, in my classes, one of the exercises we would do is I would give my class two to three telling sentences, like it hit me or I lost it, right? Very basic telling sentences. And I would tell them, I'll give them about five minutes to write a showing sentence. And then we would share and critique each other on what worked and what didn't. So this is a good way to practice yourself, right? If you know that you struggle with writing descriptive sentences within your larger essay, start off small, start off with specific sentences that should be made better, right? So now show, don't tell is a great technique, but here's the big fear of it. You have to be a good decision maker of when to show and when not to show. What do I mean by that? If you show, don't tell for every single sentence, it doesn't really make sense because one, your essay is gonna be extremely long, but also that when you do show, don't tell, you're actually supposed to be causing the reader to pay attention closer to that particular moment. So if you show, don't tell everywhere, then you're telling the reader, wait, all of your essay is important, but that's not good, right? You have to, in order to have important moments, they have to be more elevated than other parts. Does everybody understand that? An essay needs to have specific moments that are supposed to stand out, right? In your body paragraphs, they're supposed to be the supporting part. So if you show, don't tell anywhere else besides those parts, then you're making the other parts seem just as important as them. And that's not effective in writing. Does everyone understand that? Any questions so far on that? Okay, great. So here are some more examples, right? Uh, Dave thought Brenda was acting secretive. Brenda slammed his dresser drawer shut and spun around, her hands hidden behind her back. Her lips jerked into a stiff smile. Dave, I, I thought you wouldn't be home until six o'clock. So again, another moment of showing rather than telling. And so these are things you all can practice even within yourselves, right? Amongst yourselves at home uh, with your parents. And this is just a way to get better at writing specifically moments that are important. Does everyone understand? Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and move on so, because here's just a few more examples of them. And instead now I'm gonna get to the structure of how you should be organizing your essay. So let's go back to that term that I used before, personal narrative. Personal narrative is more like a story, right? And it's, and I like calling it a personal narrative rather than an essay because it's oftentimes about you, right? So there's a clear introduction, right? I know I say, so there's the hook that we've talked about before, setting the scene, telling them what's happening, right? Outlining your essay a little bit, right? And of course to you, right? That it, and it's a story about something that happened to you, the writer and that it's not fiction in this case. Now, the next sentence has thesis statement, but I've never really liked the, this term for this particular essay. So I'm gonna get rid of it here. And instead of a thesis statement, it should kind of be like the answer to the prompt, right? So we're gonna rewrite here, answer to the prompt. Everyone understand? So it should be very clear how you're answering the prompt from the very beginning. This is another way for you to stay on topic, right? Because what was 1A of what you need to do for the Hunter test? You need to answer the prompt. So it has to be clear from the get-go. Any questions? Okay, great. Now in each of your body paragraphs, you're gonna do show, don't tell. You're gonna have supporting evidence, right? Of why this is a good answer to your prompt, right? If the answer to your prompt was, my mom is my everyday superhero because she is blank and blank, right? She is A and B then we need supporting evidence for how she is helpful, how she is resourceful, how she is um, caring, so on and so forth. 
it needs to show a passage of time, right? Your story needs to continuously move along. It can't just be stuck in one place in time. And so transitions are ridiculously important then. Oftentimes when you all learn about writing at your age in different schools, they talk about transitions from a paragraph to paragraph perspective, but really think about your transitions from a sentence to sentence perspective. As I go from one sentence to the next, is it very clear to the reader what is happening? You wanna make sure that the reader is always clear of what's going on because think about it yourselves for a second. If you're reading something that you don't understand or you're having a hard time to follow, you'll get frustrated, right? In the same exact sense, if a hunter teacher who's gonna be grading your essay is reading your essay and they can't follow what's going on from point A to point B, they're gonna get frustrated with your essay and they're gonna to wanna to stop reading. Does everyone understand? Did any of you guys have, um, um, have younger siblings or um, like very little cousins? When you ask them to try to explain a story, they're like all over the place, right? Because they know what happened because they were there, but they're having a hard time telling you what happened. In the essay, you have to avoid doing the same things that they do, which is going all over the place. It needs to be linear, right? There needs to be a clear order to how you're explaining everything. That's what I want to stress in your body paragraphs. Because the body paragraphs are really like the meat of the essay, right? That's where everything is. Does everyone understand? Okay, fantastic. We're going to move on to now the conclusion. The conclusion is very important. And one of the hardest parts is this thing called the so what in the conclusion. Uh, so of course in the conclusion you're going to you're going to explain what's been going on right you're going to restate what's what you've talked about already your answer to the prompt what the reasons were for who you picked as your favorite person if that was the prompt right um and then at the end you need to kind of tie it back to a few things one you have to tie it back to the prompt but also what's the larger lesson behind the story why was this story important for the reader to get to know you, right? Um, if, for example, Ivan wrote this, why is this story very important to get to know Ivan or Michaela or whoever it is, right? I'm just looking at random names right now. Does everyone understand? So why is this particular story helpful for me to get to know Theo, so on and so forth? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. I feel like this is a good place to stop. So I'm going to go back to the chat and look through questions right now. So I'm going to start from the top. Let's see. What was the question of writing topic in your year? In my year, it was 2006. It was right about someone who inspires you. I ended up writing about my dad. Um, Gabby asked about the visual essay. How do you structure it? So we're going to actually go talk about the visual essay in just a bit, Gabby. So don't worry. I'll get back to that. Um, and then let's see. Ken, let's say you write about your superheroes, your mom, but in the first paragraph you write about how you do not like her, but in the last paragraph you tell her how you love her. Is it fine if you do not state the answer in the first paragraph? So for whoever asked that question, I don't think that's the best way of handling it just because you have a, you have a longer task to follow. We're also going to talk about how planning an essay is important by looking at how much space they give you. So over the last few years, this has been a trend, right? And we're going to talk about trends in a little bit later of what's been going on. They've been giving you kind of less and less room to write. So it's become even more important about how you plan your essay. What vocab word can you use? Uh, I mean, you can use a lot, right? As long as you're using it appropriately. Think about the context, right? Why do you call it an essay if they're asking you to tell a story? Well, sometimes they're asking you to tell a story and sometimes they're not. So that's why I think I, I don't like calling it an essay as much as I like calling it a personal narrative. But for layman's terms, we always go with Hunter essay. I've heard that the conclusion should state why the subject is important. How do I do this? So we're going to work on that later. So that's the so what. Um, during the quiz, can you get extra paper? Or do you have limited space? Ah, so for the Hunter test, whatever space they give you, that's the space you get. You can always ask for extra scrap paper. But the way it works is, let's say this is your piece of paper. I hope everyone can still see me drawing on the screen. And these are lines that's given to you. And there's usually like a box around those lines. So this box that I'm marking down in red, I'm overshading, that's, what's get, that's the part that gets scanned and given to the graders. Two people grade your essay, and if their scores are very different, then a third person looks at it. That's the way it works. So if you write anything outside of the box, it won't get scanned. So you have limited space to use. So if you ask for extra paper, that's not gonna be given to you because it won't be scanned. Does everyone understand? 
So space and planning for that space is really important. Remember, a sign of a good writer is not just being able to write well, but it's being able to write well in the space that's given to them. That's part of the job, right? Um, are you supposed to roadmap in the introduction or give a background information? Yeah, it's usually a good idea to provide background information in the introduction so that, <coughs> so that your body paragraphs can keep on working the way they're supposed to. <coughs> Will it say, sorry, will it say if it's a paragraph essay? So it's not going to say if it's a paragraph essay or not, it's up to you how you organize. And we'll talk about the different ways to organize, but we're usually gonna, my default has always been to stick with a four paragraph essay. And I'll tell you all why in just a bit when we th think about planning the essay. What examples or vocabulary can you use of? Um, instead of saying I was happy or excited, you can say I was ecstatic. That's an example of a vocabulary word that's different. Um, Elizabeth, I think that was the person who asked, okay. I hope that's answered all these preliminary questions and we're gonna move on to the next bit because it's already 8.30 and we have about 30 more minutes anyway. So I don't wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I know it's a school night, you guys have school tomorrow. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next page. So what to write about? That's usually where people get stuck. So what I like to do, and you all have probably been doing this uh, without realizing it sometimes, and I hope you all have been doing it, um, but more intentionally, is I like to, people to create a toolbox between four sections of topics. And this toolbox is usually enough to help people um, think of any topic and have something to say about it. And usually these four bigger topic areas or genres are broken down like this. You have people, you have places, you have objects, and you also have experiences or lessons. And I'll give you some examples, right? So my, one of my most famous examples that I always use year to year is a grandfather's pen as both an object and a person, right? Because my grandfather's linked with that pen and then the pen is the object itself. It's one of the essays that I use most often. If you all have ever watched any color video, it's probably been up there. Um, it's an example I use oftentimes for multiple different essays, right? Another example I can give you is a student of mine uh, in the past has used chess. And so if their idea is chess, there's a lot of different things that they can go around with. One is they can talk about um, Marshall Chess Club, right? That's where they go to play chess. Um, it's a place in Manhattan that where they go. People, they can talk about their chess teacher. In terms of objects, they can talk about their oldest chess set or the one that they practice from at home by themselves, whatever it may be. And lessons, they can talk about winning and losing in chess. But do you understand how that singular topic of chess that's been a very important part of their life, they can write about in four different methods and ways. So if the essay topic was write about someone who means a lot to you, they can write about their chess teacher. Write about a time you learned from failure, they can learn about losing at chess. Learn about, uh, describe a place that you often visit or descri describe a journey through New York City. Well, I go to Marshall Chess Club every single Saturday with my dad and on our way back, we stop by um, this bagel place, right? So you have one paragraph about Marshall Chess Club and you have another one about his bagel place. Do you understand what I mean? So it's very effective because it, multi it goes through multiple avenues of tackling an essay question. So what am I saying? I'm not telling you all to come up with one topic that you can use for everything. That's nearly impossible. But create a nice little toolbox of ideas that you can adapt for multiple essays. Why is this good? Because you wanna to pick topics that are adaptable because then you will have practice writing about them, right? Think back to the essays you all have been working on for the last few weeks. Are there certain topics you find yourself writing about over and over again? There probably is, right? To the tutor, to your tutor, right? The person you're working with, they're probably sick and tired of hearing about the same old chess um, essay that you've been writing. But for the hunter teacher, they won't have ever heard it before from you. Does everyone understand? So if the, if the topic you have picked works, go with it. Because what a lot of people do is they waste time picking the right topic. Does everyone understand? The other thing is the hardest part about this test is not really writing. I don't think so. 
I think all of you have been working extremely hard for the last few weeks, the last few months, and the writing bit is what you've improved on. But the hardest part is when you read that prompt on, in the middle of the test, there's no one behind you to tell you this is a good idea, this is a bad idea. So the hardest part of the test is what? That decision making. I know that for a fact, having seen literally hundreds of students take this exam, including my brother. So my younger brother, who is extremely smart in his own right, went to Stai, but he did not get into Hunter. Not because he was a bad test taker. He was an extremely good test taker. I think multiple choice wise, he was much better than I ever was. But it's, and it's not that he was a bad writer, but the decision he made about the topic he chose to write about was not a good one. And that's what's really hard. Does everyone understand that? That's why if you pre-prepare a nice toolbox of ideas, right? If you already know what are all the things that I can write about that almost fit into any type of essay, right? So how do you do that? Do, now do you have to write 100 essays before the test on Wednesday? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that what you have to do is you have to go through a list of essay topics with your parents. This is one of the best exercises I tell parents that they can do with their kids. At the dinner table, right? We're all eating. And your mom can just be like, okay, so what if the topic was right about a time when you, had, when you were afraid to do something, but you did it anyway? So you sit there and you have to think of it in five minutes. Within five minutes, you should be able to tell your mom what your essay is going to be about. And then after that, you're going to have to talk about um, how you're going to organize your essay. If you can do that verbal planning, it's going to put you way ahead of anyone else. So from now until Wednesday, I'm asking you to write 100 essays, but I'm asking you to do 100 essay topics like this. Over the dinner table, while you're talking, think about all the different prompts that could show up, right? You're never gonna be able to predict it 100%. And we're gonna talk about that later, why as well. But if you get into the habit of being able to be creative, thinking of topics and thinking about ways to answer them, that's gonna make you a better decision maker. Because after you tell your mom, okay, mom, I think I'm going to write about this. This is the way I'm going to organize it. Then you can discuss, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? And over time, right, you're going to become a better decision maker in the moment. Does everyone understand? Okay. I see, David, you have a question. Uh, I see your hand raised. Um, can you put it into the chat? <coughs> okay, thanks. Now, another person just asked, because I'm looking at the chat, is it more likely to get in if you talk about something different than most people? Say if a lot of people say that their everyday superhero is their mom and I say it's a sw swimming coach, is something like that if I write it well? So that last part is what, you, uh, is what we need to focus on. You could all write the same essay about your mom, but it's going to be about who wrote it well. Does everyone understand that? So don't think like, oh, everyone's going to write about their mom, so I need to think of something weird and different that's going to make me stand out. Not necessarily. It's about what can you write best? Does everyone understand that? Okay, great. I hope that's clear to everyone. So this is an exercise I tell parents to do all the time. You know why? Because all of you right now staring at me through your computer screen are probably wondering, hey, I'm only 11 or 12 years old. What have I done with my life? What's cool that I can write about? Trust me, we have all been through that. Adults struggle with writing about themselves. And trust me, you have things to write about. That's why it's best to ask your parents because if you think your life is boring, they can tell you tons of things that have happened that you can write essays about. Does everyone understand that? Okay, great. So after you get those big topics, think about moments or experiences and separate them up into body paragraphs. Because that's the best way to write about it, right? So for example, even if I picked my mom and I said my mom is caring and I said that she's helpful, I now need a story, a mini story that gives an example of her being caring and her being helpful. So I call these recyclable moments because once, right? Let me go through this. Caring and helpful. So once these two go through, right? In these examples, well, you can reuse these examples over and over again. That's why I call them recyclable, right? So let's go back to that idea I had about my grandfather's pen. Well, I could talk about my grandfather's pen in different essay topics, such as, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a journalist. My grandfather was a journalist. He left me a pen. What's an everyday object that means a lot to you more than its intended use? My grandfather's pen means a lot to me. It inspired me to write. And now that's why I want to be a writer, so on and so forth, right? What career do you, do you see? Um, so we already did the career one. 
who's someone you admire and why? Well, my grandfather, he used to be a journalist. He left his pen with me. Do you see how the same topic can be recycled into three completely different prompts? That's the goal here. So that you don't have to reinvent the wheel in the middle of the test. I know that that works and I can know when to adapt it to multiple essay topics. At the same time, don't try to force it. So for example, if the essay topic was write about a time of failure, I'm not gonna write about my grandfather's pen. That has nothing to do with failure with me, right? Don't just force it because you've used that idea often. So make sure that that decision-making aspect, I'm telling you, that's what's gonna make you stand out. Making the right decision to answer the prompt and then write the way you've been practicing to write. Does everyone understand? Fantastic. All right, let's go. So now let's plan our own. So how long should you take to write the essay? It should be about an hour, right? An hour for each one, right? Roughly. Usually people say take five to, minute, five to 10 minutes to plan, 30 to 40 minutes to write, and about five to 10 minutes to proofread slash edit. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you all a few things. If you need to spend extra time on planning, I would rather you do that. A well-planned essay takes less time to write. Think about that. If you know what you're gonna write about one after the other, every single point, you don't have to be stuck there writing. Another reason why this is really good. If you have a really well thought out body paragraph, right? You're gonna write that first body paragraph really well. But then in the second one, you're gonna struggle because you didn't plan it as much. And there's gonna be a big disconnect. In that disconnect, it's gonna feel like to the reader that two people wrote this essay, right? That this first person really knew what they were talking about and then they fell off. Does that make sense? So that's something that you do not want, <coughs> that you do not want. Will your planning sheet be graded? No. The only things on the test that will be graded, remember, they're gonna collect everything from you. But the only things that matter is gonna be your essay, not your planning page, your actual essay, and the Scantron where you bubbled in your uh, answer choices for multiple choice. Those are the only two pieces that they really care about. Everything else is kind of scrap paper. Does everyone understand? Okay. So now I'm gonna show you another exercise that I used to do with my class. We would collectively plan an essay, and then that essay would be homework for everyone to write because everyone has a different way of writing and then we would compare them and grade all of the essays together. Because part of being a good writer is being able to tell good writing apart from bad writing. So here's an example of a plan. And this is exactly how I plan all my essays. And it takes a bit of time. It takes probably about 10 minutes every single time for me. First, make sure I know what the prompt is about. Write about your first time doing something, describe how you felt. Answer, my first time on a roller coaster. The hook is literally what I would write in the essay. Our lives are marked by many firsts. From our first time walking to our first time attending school, these moments are celebrated and remembered well. One first of mine that I find most memorable is my first time on a roller coaster. There you go. Easy, simple, to the point, answers the prompt, introduces the reader, brings them in with something that they can relate to, so on and so forth. Starts off general. There's, this is not the one right way of starting. You could set the scene. There's a lot of different ways to start an essay. But this is a hook that works for me and I find pretty easy to do. Good. Next, I'm going to write it like a story. So in body paragraph one, our annual family trip to Dorney Park. That's a park in Pennsylvania. Uh, who's going? Mom, dad, and my younger brother. During the two and a half hour car ride, all I could think about was how I was finally old enough to move past the kiddie rides. We'll ride the roller coaster for the first time. Once we get to the park, my dad and I stood online. As we got closer and closer to the front, um, and the more I heard people screaming, the more scared I got. Right before we were going to be next, I panicked and left the line and dragged my dad with me. So that's where body paragraph one ends. You'll notice that I included a lot of bullet points to help me move the story along so I know what I'm going to write about at every point. But remember that thing I talked to you all about a few minutes ago. Am I going to do show, don't tell for each of these bullet points? No, I'm not. I'm only going to pick the important ones. So what's an important one? This one is an important one. Right as we got close, I panicked and I left. These two kind of go hand in hand because it builds on each other. Does that make sense? And the other big moment in this paragraph was this one. This anticipation of getting to ride my first big roller coaster. Because the prompt was about your first time doing something. Does everybody understand? So even though I'm making all these little bullet points to help me plan along how I'm going to write my essay, that's not everywhere I'm going to do show, don't tell. 
doing show don't tell in the right moments is also another making a good decision part of being a writer. This is what makes people good essays stand out from bad essays. Does everyone understand? Great. Next, body paragraph two. I was disappointed in myself. My mom and dad assured me it was no big deal. We went on the old classic rides. My younger brother still had fun on them, but I was very bored by them. They no longer excited me. I had outgrown them. This made me more determined to try the roller coaster again. I'm back in line with mom and dad. Got on the roller coaster. My experience, unbelievable mix of pure uh, mix of fear and excitement and pure joy. Roller coaster of emotions. I put this in quotes because I was like, I really want to use this phrase because I think it works well. So I know that this is definitely going to be a showing moment. Glad I did it. I felt accomplished. It, it says to describe how you felt. So I know this is going to be a showing moment. And they kind of go hand in hand again. And the other one is going to be, this is the reason why I was determined to go back. It's because my brother was having fun, but I was not because I was still on those little kitty rides and I was disappointed. So do you see how I'm making these decisions before I ever start writing? That, oh, this is where I'm going to do SDT, show, don't tell. SDT, show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. And the last bit of my plan that I always do is I take care of the so what. So my, what's my so what going to be here? My experience of overcoming my initial fear of riding the roller coaster helped me see that though trying new things can be scary, without trying, it's impossible to, deter to determine whether it's something I would enjoy or not. So this is the big lesson or takeaway from my first time, right? That if I didn't go back and try that roller coaster out, even though I was scared, I would never know if, I, if, if it was something I was going to enjoy or not. Does everyone understand? And this is a very standard, easy to plan. It took us as a class probably about 12 minutes to plan this. And then it took everyone way less than 40 minutes to write it because they knew right after each step what they were supposed to write next. But everyone's writing style is different. They use different vocabulary. Their description is different. So it doesn't even matter if you have the same essay planned as someone else because your writing can be, your writing will be vastly different from theirs. Does everyone understand that? So these are, everything I'm showing you today are individual components of what it takes to become a good writer. And if you know you're weak at planning, work on that. If you know that you need more help with decision-making, just tell your mom, mom, let's go through a hundred prompts. Let me try to give you ideas for each one. And you tell me what's a good idea. What is, let's think about that. Okay. Let me move on. Is everyone good with this? This is a good place to kind of like stop uh, before I and take questions if you guys have any. Will your planning sheet be graded? No, it will not. I have heard that in the essay, I should introduce a conflict. Is that important? You don't need to fight anyone. There doesn't need to necessarily be a conflict. Some essays are just describe something. So there's no need for conflict there. Uh, Connor, you said the last one. I don't know what that means. Okay. Also, if I'm going too quickly, please let me know. It's just, I want to be respect, respectful of the time. That's the reason why we're going at this pace. And I still have a few more slides to show y'all. Is dialogue good or bad? Usually dialogue is bad. The reason why is because the way to properly write dialogue, it takes up a lot of space. And space is not something you always have. Okay? All righty. I'm going to move on then because it doesn't seem like there are more questions in the moment. So I want to show you two examples of different styles of writing an essay that students way like over 10 years ago wrote for me. Okay. Challenges of an only child. So this is um, right about, um, right about a lesson um, or right about a fact of life that you learned or something like that. I think that's what this was along the lines of. Okay. I walk up the hill with my friends, then turn into a cul-de-sac, go to the front porch, put the key in the lock, turn and step in. The house breathes a kind of spooky hello as I set my books down and go to the kitchen where the inevitable note is waiting. Have a snack, be home soon, I love you. As I'm munching cookies, I think how I'd like to go out and shoot a few hoops if I had someone to do it with. You can play Nintendo by yourself, but it isn't the same. So I forget that for now, I should be doing my Spanish homework anyway. Too bad I don't have an older brother or sister to help conjugate all those dumb verbs. I would call a friend, sure, but if I had a brother or sister, I'd have a built-in friend. While I'm, feeling sorry, while I'm feeling so sorry for myself, I hear my friends Denise and Kevin across the street. She's screaming bloody murder because he is throwing leaves in her hair and threatening to put a beetle in her backpack. She has just stepped on his new Nikes. 
I do not have these squabbles. I guess the big advantage, if you call it that, to being an only child is that my life is my own. Nobody borrows my CDs or my books or my clothes. I also get a bigger allowance than I probably would if I had siblings. My parents take me everywhere, from the mall to the East Coast. Maybe they wouldn't if they had other kids. On the other hand, it wouldn't be more fun going if I had someone my own age. It would be more fun going if I had someone my own age. All these great advantages are overshadowed by one big disadvantage, though. And it's the main reason I would change things if I could. When you are an only child, your parents depend on you to be the big success all the time. You are their big hope, so you cannot fail. You have to be good at sports, popular, have good grades. You need a career goal. You have to have neat hair and clothes that, make, that look pressed. You have to have good grammar, clean socks, good breath, and table manners. If you've ever felt jealous of somebody who is an only child, don't. It's a lot of pressure. I often wish for a little screw-up brother or sister my parents could worry about for a while. So while having a neat room with nothing disturbed is great, I'd take a brother or sister in a minute if I could. The big irony is, if I had that mythical brother or sister, I'd probably be wishing myself an only child again. The first time my baseball shirt didn't come back or my stereo got broken. Life is like that. What you don't have always seems to be the thing you want. So this time, the lesson is introduced all the way at the end. But it works because this writer kept your attention throughout the entire thing. Is this essay perfect? Not by any means. There's a lot of weird phrasing here. Of course, this was a long time ago. So CDs sound weird to you guys, right? You're like, uh, everything's on Spotify, Mo. So, so it's, I know it's different, but this is from, it's the same ideas. For example, I probably wouldn't say those dumb verbs. When I asked the student what they meant by East Coast, they meant like, you know how on the coast there's the beach? And they couldn't think of the word beach in the moment. So that's what they meant. Um, here they ran out of things to say clearly because they started talking about you have to have neat hair and clothes that look pressed, as well as table matters and clean socks and good breath. And I was like, well, everyone needs to have those things. That doesn't really make sense to include here. So it's those things, those little things like that that are off. But the ideas are good, it's well organized, and it's really descriptive. This essay is something that's going to be memorable. All right, let me move on to the next one. This one is the one you all are probably familiar with. Describe the journey home, right? Or describe a journey. So this is their uh, journey back from the um, bus stop. And this one is less structured because if you notice, this one is a four paragraph essay, but this one is little mini paragraphs here and there. Walking home from my bus stop is often an adventure. I never know when I'm going to encounter a big dog, an angry neighbor, or perhaps even a killer tree. It was a beautiful day. The sky was blue with only a few lacy clouds. The air was cool and fresh. Crisp leaves were crackling beneath my feet. It would have been a wonderful day to walk slowly, enjoying the weather. Unfortunately, I had forgotten my coat and otherwise nice weather was chilling me to the bone. To make matters worse, my back was hurting from a ligament I pulled during soccer, school, soccer practice earlier in the week. So despite the pleasant surroundings, I was feeling rather miserable. Then my mind began to wonder, as it often does, and began to think of my science class where we were studying the brain <coughs> Sorry, and had just discussed the idea of um, hypnosis helping with minor pain. I also remember that hypnosis and meditation were similar. Thinking of this reminded me, reminded of a talk I had once had with my stepdad about meditation. I put these thoughts together and came up with a great idea for the day. To relieve my suffering from the cold and my back pain, I would meditate while walking home. Being the whimsical person I am, I decided that I would try this idea, disregarding the protests of the senior, more logical voice in my head. To begin with, I concentrated on warmth. I thought of fires of warm houses of summertime. I slowed my breathing to promote a more relaxed state. It was all going rather well. I was actually feeling warmer and my back wasn't bothering me as much. I smiled. Then I realized my nose hurt. A few seconds later, I figured out the cause. I'd run into a tree, not just any tree, but a big rough bark tree. I immediately jumped away, hopping in a circle, yelping with pain. Next, I sat down and felt my nose to make sure it wasn't flat. It wasn't. To show the tree my rage, I kicked it, resulting in a hurt foot. I glared at it menacingly, figuring that it couldn't hurt me anymore if I just looked at it. I'm sure the big dogs and the angry neighbors were all getting a good laugh by now. And so I continued home, cold, aching back, hurt nose, bruised foot. Note to self, no more meditating while walking. So this is also a really well done essay, but this is not an essay that I think everyone could write. The reason why is because the person who wrote this, he's a very whimsical kid, to put it in his own words. He's very eccentric. So this role fits him. And if you ever met him, you would be like, yep, this is his right. There are a few things that I would, of course, change. Uh, but things I want to point out that he did really well. What season was this, by the way? Does anyone know? If you were paying attention, you would know. You can write it in the chat if you think you've got it figured out. Yes, it's fall. Crisp leaves, the weather getting colder, right? All of these things, little tiny details. That sets the tone. What else do we know about this student? They have a stepdad. There's someone who's really interested in science, right? Little things like that. 
So these little things that I've been telling you all about, how your essay is always going to be about you to some degree, they come out in your writing. This essay is more of a story with no thesis, and that's okay because this story's prompt. So remember, it's always the prompt that sets the tone. The prompt was describe a journey home. They just described or describe a journey that you take. So they just described a journey through uh, coming back home from the bus stop, right? And they are miserable in the beginning, and that's fine, right? Does everyone understand how this one's different and it still works? So I'm just trying to show you that there are different styles. So if you feel like someone writes differently than you, it doesn't mean you have to copy them. And if you like these, these are not the only way to write these essays either. That's what I'm trying to show you with these examples, okay? Now we're gonna talk about, well, what's been happening well, through the years at Hunter? As you all know, the Hunter test is very different from other tests. Why? Because of this essay you need to write as a sixth grader, right? And that decision-making that we've talked about through the years. And of course, there are prep classes at Queller and other places as well that tried their best to train people to do this better. And Hunter doesn't like that. They want students who can naturally think for themselves and so on and so forth. So how do they make the test less predictable? That's what their goal is right now. Does everyone understand? So what have they been doing? Well, one, they've been changing the length of space that they give you to write your essay. So sometimes four paragraph essays don't work. So you have to look at the length and you have to think, okay, I may not have space for four paragraphs. I might have to write a three paragraph essay. One body, an introduction and a conclusion. So you have to adapt. The second thing is they've been doing what? Well, in years past, they've now changed it so that you don't only have one prompt. Sometimes you have multiple prompts. Does everyone understand? So you have to pick one. So that's another way that they can put, um, have more decision-making put on you. And then of course, their latest trick is a visual essay of this, something like this, where they'll give you a bunch of pictures and they'll say, read the prompts below and answer each question in one paragraph. Using the pictures above, describe how one of the objects can be meaningful to the family pictured above. And then unrelated, but also related, describe an object that is meaningful to you or your family. Now listen, there's two things here. This first one is about being creative. Right? Writing a story about this family by either taking this object or this object or that object, so on and so forth, right? And then the second one is you don't even have to use any of the objects here. It just says, describe an object that is meaningful to you or your family. And it's only giving you a paragraph to do each one. So again, all the things that we've been talking about still have to be taken care of. In this paragraph, you have to answer this particular prompt. My first paragraph has to answer this prompt. So this is paragraph one. Paragraph two has to answer the second prompt. The second one has to be descriptive. It's about you or your family. Does everyone understand? So at its crux, right, at the core of what makes the Hunter essay a personal narrative or, or, those, or the same exact factors that you needed to worry about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, about the Hunter essay hasn't changed. It's still about decision-making. It's still about writing and answering the prompt. It's still about being descriptive. It's still about being organized. All of those things have not changed. It's still about you. Does everyone understand that? So what's the only thing that has changed? You have to be more adaptive. And that really still hasn't changed if you really think about it. Because even back then, so I'll share with you what my brother's essay was. My brother's essay was to write about his favorite place in New York City. And he thought he would stand out and be different by writing about the hospital where he was born. And at that point in time, he had only been to that hospital twice. Once when he was born, so he was too young to remember anything. And the other time was when I accidentally broke his arm. It was an accident, I swear, I'm innocent. So besides those two times, he had nothing else to you know, use to write about. So this is why I say that you can lie in your essay, but don't make things up. Wait, Mo, aren't those two the same thing? No, they're not. If you're lying about something, it could be like, for example, if I'm in tennis, and there's a lesson I learned by playing tennis, but it didn't happen to me, it happened to my friend, then I can lie about it and say it happened to me. But I can still write about it because I play tennis. But if I don't play tennis and I try to make up a story about playing tennis, it's not gonna sound believable. Does everybody understand the difference? Good, that's what we're trying to get at. So again, I hope you have taken good notes on things to emphasize, things to avoid. And I'll leave you all with this. This is kind of like a parent's homework. This is from an old color syllabus uh, from 2019, and this really hasn't changed. I just picked this up because it has a lot of topics. So it has what, over, I think it has over 40 topics. And then of course, topics from like previous year's tests. I want you to sit on the dinner table and be like, okay, mom, describe the most recent thing you did during your spare time. What should I write about? 
Should I write about playing chess? Should I write about riding my bike? Plan those essays. This should be like rapid fire. Each one should take you five minutes. And then you should decide, is this a good essay I'm planning or is this a bad essay? That's how you become a more adaptable writer. Does everyone understand that? And the last piece of advice that I will talk to you all about before I take final questions, because I know time is almost running out, is I want you all to keep this in mind. Does your Hunter essay have to be perfect in order to get it? No, it does not. Remember what I'm about to say for now and forever? Even your school in-class essays, it's an in-class essay test, right? They're looking for your best possible first draft. If you're a proper writer, it takes many drafts, hundreds of drafts to get something published. I work with a lot of students when they apply to college. My most recent one, today they found out they got into Penn. He wrote an essay 54 times before we finally said, yes, this is the one that you're gonna uh, submit to colleges. We went through 54 drafts over two and a half months. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? So this is just an in, in the moment test essay. All they're looking for is your best possible first essay. So if you have one or two spelling mistakes, is it the end of the world? No. If you have one or two grammar mistakes, is it the end of the world? No. But if you have too many, right, where it becomes hard to understand and read your essay, then that's problematic. What they're really looking for is, are your ideas good? Is it well organized? Does your writing make sense? Are you answering the prompt? These are the things that matter. Does everyone understand? So let me look at these last few questions before I let you all go. Um, yes, all these essay prompts, I'm gonna send over this over to Ms. Cutter so she can have all of this. She has access to all your emails. Um, I'm still confused when the prompts are shown. Do you do both or one of them? You do both of them for the visual one, right? It says, read the prompts below and answer each question in one paragraph. Those were the instructions, right? Uh, I hope that answered your question, Elizabeth. Uh, what happens if you start your essay Sorry. What happens if you start your essay and realize in the middle of writing your essay that it is a bad one? Well, that's why we plan, right? That's why I would say it, take more time planning and make sure of it rather than start writing it. Um, is it okay to have, is it still okay to have unique experiences? Of course it is. Do you need to write the essay in number two pencil? I don't think you need to, but I would probably, if I were you, write it in pencil rather than pen, just because erasing is a lot easier than crossing stuff out, aesthetically speaking. It makes it easier for them to read. Should you connect the two prompts and the image prompts? It doesn't say you need to, so you don't have to. Again, when in doubt, just look for the instructions. Okay. Oh, no, do you like need number two specific? Yes. You need to have number two uh, pencils in general for the test because of the Scantron. All right. Any other questions? You can use a mechanical pencil just for the essay or even the bubble sheets as long as it's number two. Okay. Well, I know it's 9 p.m. I know you all have school tomorrow. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I hope you all the best of luck. Um, going to Hunter was, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to my life. Um, I'm very grateful for all the friends I made along the way. Friends I still keep in touch who have known me for more than half my life. And I will say this, if you don't get into Hunter, it is not the end of the world. There are tons of great schools there. My brother got into Stai. Uh, he went out to a great college. He has a great job now, right? It's not the end of the world. I know in the moment, this feels like the most important thing in the world. And it might be, right? You'll always regret it if you don't try, right? All we're looking for is for you to give it your best shot. That's really it. Testing, trust me, as someone who's taken the Hunter test, the SHSAT, the SAT, the ACT, the PSAT, the LSAT, the MCAT, the GMAT. There's a bunch of letters that make up a test. I probably touched it. So as someone who's taken a lot of tests in their life, testing never ends. Think of this as just the first step in that journey. Does everyone understand? So I wish you all the best of luck. You guys have a little bit less than a week. I think you're preparing well. You're all here. You're giving up a Thursday night to be here. So I can definitely respect your work ethic for that. So keep on working. Uh, we wish you all the best and you all are, you know, on your way. Okay. Thank you all. Have a great night.